Ronald Joseph Dominique was born January 9, 1964 in Thibodeau, Louisiana. He was the youngest of two children. He grew up in a poor family. Both of his parents were laborers. The family lived in a trailer park on the outskirts of town. Ronald was a stereotypical misfit in society. He was socially awkward. He was seen as having a melancholic attitude towards life. He lacked good communication skills, was short, and had a weight problem. This, coupled with his low self-esteem and poor health, made him a target for bullying and physical attacks. He was a quintessential school nerd. He wasn't one of the cool kids because Ronald sang in the school choir and performed with the glee club. He didn't play sports, do drugs, or drink alcohol. Life was rough for him. On top of all this, Ronald discovered he was gay. To make matters even more torturous for him, he attempted to indulge in a homosexual world. After visiting a local gay bar several times, he was outed by some of his classmates who'd seen him there. He had to deal with harassment and accusations of homosexuality, of which he vehemently denied. He had a hard time fitting in in school and fitting in with the gay community. It was too much for him. He couldn't be himself, so he left school. Though he did not fit in while he was in school, he made up for this somewhat afterwards by making a few friends after growing up and performing as a drag queen in backwoods gay bars. His performances were horrible. He impersonated Patti LaBelle, whom he loved, and it did not go over well. He did not receive any popularity from his horrid drag performances. Ronald did not give up entirely on a life of normalcy. He still tried to enrich in his life. He decided to enroll in college. He studied computer science at Nichols State University for a short time. He lost interest and dropped out. It seems that Ronald didn't know what to do with himself as a young person. It also became obvious that he was in better control of himself when he was in a structured environment. After he quit school, his behavior took a turn for the absolute worse. Ronald then went on a crime spree. He went from being considered a nobody in society to constantly getting in trouble with the law. On June 12, 1985, he was arrested on sexual harassment charges via telephone. He was ordered to pay a $75 fine for the offense. Due to his lack of education, Ronald was forced to work little jack leg jobs. He had disciplinary problems and was constantly fired. This was the first sign that something was seriously wrong with Ronald. He couldn't hold down a job. He couldn't finish anything he started from school to work. Something was not quite right with him. He survived by the kindness of his relatives and others. His mother and older sister helped him out a lot. He lived with each of them at different points of time in his life. On May 15, 1994, Ronald was arrested for drunk driving. He was fined for this offense as well. So far, he'd only received a slap on the wrist for the crimes he committed. These crimes were lightweight compared to what he would venture out into next. On August 25, 1996, Ronald was arrested for rape. Neighbors reported seeing a near nude young man leaping from the window of Ronald's sister's home, where Ronald lived at the time. Then screaming for help in the street and saying that Ronald had just raped and tried to kill him. Ronald allegedly coerced the man into coming home with him and attempted to tie him up. When the man refused, Ronald became violent. The man escaped and Ronald was arrested with his bail being set at $100,000. The case ended up being dismissed because the accuser didn't show up to court. On February 10, 2002, Dominique was arrested for assaulting a woman 
in Terraboni Parish during Mardi Gras. He claimed that the woman was driving dangerously in the parking lot and hit a baby stroller. He started arguing with her, demanding an apology. She apologized, but he still punched her in the face anyway. He was charged, but the case was later dropped after a deal of reconciliation was reached between he and the victim, with whom he had made amends. Ronald was just 5'5 five five and walked with a cane. Perhaps this is why he was not viewed as dangerous and the law kept letting him go. Because his first potential murder victim escaped, Ronald determined that he could never go back to jail. He would later say that this was why he had to kill his victims instead of getting caught. Shortly after the rape case was dismissed, Ronald killed his first victim. This was in the 90s. He would charm his victims into accompanying him. He'd meet them on the street, walking or riding their bikes, and just begin talking to them. He'd offer them a ride in his pickup truck or talk them into sex, and they'd go with him. He also met them in gay bars, luring them with offers of alcohol, drugs, and housing. His victims were very easy to fool. He even tricked them with promises of meeting with his supposed girlfriend who would be willing to have sex with them for money. After he got them to his trailer, he would overpower them, tie them up, and rape them. Investigators said that after he was finished with the rape, he would strangle the victim, load their bodies in the car, in, his, in the back of his truck, and dump them in rural areas of the six local parishes. The murder started happening in July, 1997. 19 year old David LaVon Mitchell, nicknamed Tweety, was picked up by Ronald while hitchhiking from his grandmother's house to his own after attending a relative's wedding reception with his mother, grandmother, and aunt. His aunt dropped him, dropped him off at his grandmother's house and she said that David told her that he wasn't going anywhere he was going to wait for his uncle to give him a ride back to Luling. His uncle didn't show up, so his aunt guessed David decided to try to hitchhike back to his mom's. His family didn't hear from him on Sunday, so they assumed that he was at a friend's house. On Monday morning, David's supervisor at St. Charles Parish Hospital called his mother and told her that he did not show up for work. David's aunt said that his mother called and told her that his badge and clothes were still in his room untouched and that David never missed a day from work. And if he ever stayed out overnight, he would always call his mother to let her know where he was going to be. His aunt told her sister to call the police. Bad news travels quickly. As the day progressed, David's family says they began to hear rumors throughout the Luling Estate subdivision about a black man's body being found on the river road in Hanville. Naturally, the family prayed it wasn't him. They turned on the news at noon and learned the details about the body of a young black male found in St. Charles Parish on the river road. And then a picture of David's face flashed across the screen. David's aunt said she will never forget her sister's screams. She described how it seemed that within a matter of mi a few minutes, the police detectives were at the front door telling them about David and his mother was hysterical and couldn't stop screaming and crying. She was so distraught when the Jefferson Parish coroner's office called that she couldn't even go and view the body. His aunt went with her sister's husband and her brother. The family didn't find out who killed their loved one until nine years later. David's body was found on July 14, 1997 in the ditch on the side of a highway near a wooded area in St. Charles Parish two days after he was last seen. Forensic research shows that there was ditch water in his lungs. There was no traces of physical trauma, drugs, or alcohol. His death was initially ruled as an accidental drowning. 
However, David's father insisted that his son was an excellent swimmer and that he had been killed since the water level was low and the fact that Mitchell's trousers had been lowered to his ankles when found. When Ronald confessed to the murder, allegedly, he talked David into coming home with him. He tied him up, raped, and murdered him. Ronald then dragged the body out to a sugarcane field and left it there. As it relates to how the family felt after learning of Ronald's confession, his aunt said that it was not a relief to the family. It was like starting all over again. His mother never made peace with his death. Her only child is murdered. Every year she buys him Christmas, birthday, and Easter presents. His pictures are in every room of this house. Everywhere you look, you see pictures of him. His mother, who worked for the St. Charles Parish Sheriff's Office, was deeply hurt by the comments made at the press conference describing her son as someone who led a high-risk lifestyle. His family wants the world to know that David was anything but the sort. He was a graduate of Hanville High School, a school newspaper reporter, an honor roll student who had dreams of one day becoming a St. Charles Parish coroner or a mortician. He never abused drugs or alcohol, nor did he lead a high-risk lifestyle. His aunt made it clear that David never hitchhiked frequently. He was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. In December of 1997, a passerby came across the remains of 20-year-old Gary Pierre. Gary Pierre had been recently arrested for drug trafficking. He was found fully clothed with no signs of physical trauma or drugs found in his system. The next killing occurred on July 31st, 1998. Arthur Fred Rosen said that serial killers can change patterns Sometimes they can have a cooling off period between crimes. Ronald seems to be one of those. After a seven month vacation from killing, 38 year old Larry Ranson, a drug addicted vagrant was tied up and killed by Ronald. In the early part of October, 1998, Ronald met 27 year old Oliver LeBanks in Metairie, Louisiana. Ronald claimed that the drug addicted LeBanks offered him sexual services in exchange for drug money. Ronald had sex with him, beat and strangled him. He then dropped the body off on the outskirts of Metairie. Oliver's body was found October 4th. The autopsy revealed Ronald's semen was found on Oliver's body. Oliver's relatives and friends confirmed that Oliver had been a former drug addict and father of five who had only recently resorted to the vagrant lifestyle after he'd been fired from his job for using drugs again. Between October 1998 and August 1999, Ronald committed five more murders in Jefferson Parish. In October 1998, Ronald met 16-year-old Joseph Brown and Kenner and lured him into his truck to buy crack cocaine from him. After they got high together, Ronald attacked Joseph, beating him in the head with a blunt object and then strangling him with a plastic bag. Joseph had been raised by his grandmother and had been newly put on probation after serving time for drug possession and distribution. A month later, Ronald met another teenager, 18-year-old Bruce Williams. He met his demise in a similar fashion. In May 1999, 21-year-old Manuel Reed met Ronald when Ronald was driving around town. Manuel offered to sell Ronald drugs. Ronald agreed to buy, let him in his truck, and proceeded to rape and strangle him. He dumped Manuel's body in a dumpster in the city's industrial zone afterwards. This was about a mile from where 16-year-old Joseph's body was found. Semen traces were found in his body, which were traced to an unknown male. Ronald seemed to be on a rampage. He was completely out of control. A month later, he killed 21-year-old Angel Mejia, 
who was homeless with past convictions of drug possession. Ronald tried to dump his body in a garbage container, but once he saw that it was full, he discarded it on the street. Upon examination, the coroner concluded that Angel had recently used drugs and had been tied up with rope before his death. As the investigation heated up, law enforcement established that Angel, Joseph, and Gary had all knew and lived in close proximity to each other. Late August, Ronald met 34-year-old drug addict Mitchell Johnson. He offered him drugs in exchange for sexual favors. Then he took him to the forest outside Metairie where he tied, raped, and strangled him. Mitchell's new body was found on September 1st with clues that his killer had tied him up. In January 2000, Ronald killed 23-year-old Michael Vincent in La Forge Parish. In early October, he killed 20-year-old Kenneth Randall Jr who was a thrice prosecuted child molester who lived near him in the trailer park. He found out what Kenneth had done and lured him to his trailer by telling him that a girl wanted to have sex with him there, then attacked him, tied him up, raped and strangled him. He took his body to a field outside the city limits. His partially naked remains with signs of bondage were found on October 6th. October 12, 2002, Ronald met 26-year-old Anoka Jones in the late evening in Homa. Anoka was a broke, petty criminal. Ronald attacked Anoka, tied him up, raped, and strangled him. He dumped his body under a highway overpass where it was discovered quickly several hours later. Around this time, Ronald and his sister moved to rural Bayou Blue, a mostly Cajun community of around 32,000 people. He found a job as a specialist who checked electricity levels at a local power supply, to which he was allowed to periodically travel around the remote areas of the city. He killed 19-year-old Jatrell Woods and dumped his body and bicycle in a reed field outside the city. The trail was undiscovered until May 24, 2003. By then, he was decomposed and partially naked. The cause of death was thought to be asphyxiation, but when Ronald was arrested, it was considered to be accidental in nature since the trail had asthma. In October 2004, Ronald met 46-year-old Larry Matthews, who was a drug dealer and addict. He lured him to his house with the promise of drugs. Larry overdosed and lost consciousness. This allowed for Ronald to rape and strangle him. Ronald dumped his body 20 miles away from the house. When Larry went missing, nobody reported him missing because he was homeless. His identity had to be established by his fingerprints. After this point, Ronald changed his victim profile after murdering Larry. The body of 21-year-old Michael Barnett was found on October 24, 2004. He was Ronald's first white victim. Ronald's next victim was 22-year-old Leon Lyrit, an alcoholic vagrant who lived with friends and acquaintances because of his bombastic behavior. It was later found out that he had lived with two of Ronald's previous victims, Anoka and Michael. In fact, Leon had been the prime suspect in Anoka's murder because he was the last known person at the time to have seen him alive before he disappeared. Two months later in April, Ronald met 31-year-old August Watkins, a homeless man he picked up in his truck with promises of an overnight stay. After Ronald got Watkins in his trailer, he plied him with alcohol and offered him sex with a female acquaintance before tying him up and raping and strangling him. When August's body was found, the police began to consider that they may be looking for a serial offender who was committing murders in Kenner and Homa, since the killers in both areas demonstrated a strikingly similar modus operandi. The case was handed to the FBI. Just days after killing August, Ronald killed another white male, 23-year-old 
Kurt Cunningham in a similar manner. He then went on to kill two more males with the same pattern that summer. 28-year-old Alonzo Hogan in St. Charles Parish and 17-year-old Wayne Smith in Terraboni Parish. He lured the two of them with promises of having sex with one of his female friends. Alonzo and Wayne did not fall under the same category as Ronald's most recent victims. They had no prior criminal convictions and weren't known to use drugs. Alonzo had been raped by Ronald pre-mortem, while no traces of semen were found on Wayne's corpse since his body had been disposed of in a canal and was severely decomposed in only a matter of days. September 2005, Ronald murdered 40-year-old Chris DeVille, who was a hitchhiker trying to get a ride out of Napoleonville after Hurricane Katrina. Ronald dumped his corpse in a reed field. Unfortunately, it was eaten by rodents over the next few weeks, and after his skeletal remains were discovered in October, they had to be identified by relatives with the help of ID cards and other personal belongings left beside the body. In late November, Ronald killed his third and final white victim, 21-year-old Nicholas Pellegrin, a drug addict in the Forge Parish. During the investigation of his death, Nicholas's relatives told the police that shortly before his death, he borrowed $400 from local drug dealers and had missed the payment date and had begun receiving death threats. So before Ronald was captured, Nicholas's death was thought to be drug related. The last confirmed victim was 27 year old Christopher Sutterfield. Christopher had an extensive rap sheet. He had been pros prosecuted for theft, drug possession, assisting in juvenile delinquency, violation of public order, and aggravated assault, for which he served a two year prison sentence and was later left without a home. Christopher was bisexual. He met Ronald in the summer of 2006 after which they began dating. On October 14th, while out on a date together in Iberville Parish, Ronald hit Christopher on the head with a heavy object, causing him to lose consciousness. When his body was found, police interviewed his relatives, friends, and acquaintances. All of them confirmed that they had last seen him with a man driving in a black SUV, but no one was able to describe the companion's appearance. Ronald came under police suspicion in November 2006 after Ricky Wallace, a resident of Bayou Blue, contacted the police telling his parole officer that he had been lured to Ronald's trailer. Ronald tried to convince him that his girlfriend enjoyed bondage and offered to tie Ricky up. Ricky refused and was allowed to leave. His testimony was not trustworthy at first because he was a drug addict and was known for lying repeatedly in the past. Even so, Ronald was detained and questioned by the police. While he was held at the station, he was asked to donate a blood sample. Strangely, he agreed. DNA testing matched Ronald's profile with that of the elusive killer who had left behind semen traces on the body of Oliver LeBlanc's and Manuel Reed. Subsequently, resulting in an arrest warrant. On December 1st, 2006, Ronald was arrested at a homeless shelter in Homa and charged with two murders. He started talking in a short period of time and confessed to more murders. He told the police that he knew it was a matter of time before he was captured, so he moved out of his sister's house in order not to inconvenience her. He was already under 24 hour surveillance. His trailer was parked outside of her home. He cooperated with the police and confessed to 23 murders, describing them in details only the killer would know. New charges were brought against him, but despite his confession, he bizarrely refused to admit guilt in the attacks. He stated that most of his victims agreed to be tied, handcuffed, and treated in similar manners due to their addictions and other issues since they came to earn money. He claimed that if the victim refused to do so, he let them go without harming them. If the man appeared to be straight, he would show them a picture of a woman he claimed to be his wife. 
Allegedly, he told a man he was looking for a sex partner for his wife. That was how he was able to trick them so easily. He declared that his motive was to get rid of any witnesses because he did not want to go back to prison. In his opinion, after his 1996 arrest for rape, he was strongly impacted, allegedly remaining in constantly negative emotional states and even began to show symptoms of a mental disorder. Ronald walked with a cane and complained of a serious heart condition that had caused him to have several heart attacks in the recent months. News reporters captured images of him leaning heavily on a cane and hobbling into jail surrounded by detectives. Those who knew him said that he presented himself as being on the brink of death. Law enforcement didn't fall for the act. They said he had minor heart trouble. He played it up so to garner sympathy because just months prior, he had been lugging around the bodies of the men he had raped and murdered. It became quite clear that no one ever actually knew Ronald Dominique that well. He was a good neighbor and loving uncle. It never would have occurred to anyone that he could be an evil killer. A bar owner who dated Ronald's cousin was shocked to learn that Ronald had been arrested. He knew Ronald to be quiet and never causing problems. He barely drank sip sodas and shot pool. Another longtime acquaintance who owned a video rental store down the street from Ronald's sister's mobile home was stunned as well. She stated that Ronald was a frequent customer at the video store for years. She also said that she knew he was gay. He rented gay porn and sometimes talked to her about dates he'd had with men. He liked comedies and often rented children's movies for his nieces and nephews. One day, Ronald had walked in the video store and told her that the police suspected him of being the Homer area serial killer. The store owner took it as a joke. The video store owner appears to be the only person who, who knew Ronald liked men. No one else knew him, and sp no one else who knew him spoke publicly about him, mentioned anything about him dating men. She was the only one. A few people, straight and gay, described Ronald as a loner and an outcast. One of his former roommates told the Courier newspaper that Ronald didn't have many friends. He didn't keep friends. The roommate lived with Ronald briefly in the mid-1980s. He said he didn't recall Ronald dating or bringing men home. Crime Library asked the video store owner if she thought Ronald's dates could actually have been his way of referring to the men he is charged with killing. She said, I don't want to think so, but I don't know. The patrons of a gay bar said that no one liked Ronald much, but he seemed harmless. One of the men that shot pool with him said that he got along with Ronald pretty well, and he seemed like an okay guy, but you could tell he was a little off. You could tell that there was definitely something different about him. He was kind of an outcast. He wasn't popular in the gay community. People in the gay community referred to Ronald as Miss Moped because he won a moped in a contest at a McDonald's and he used it for transportation. It was assumed that he was teased a lot. A former neighbor of Ronald's who lived across the street from his sister's trailer said that Ronald was a good neighbor. He was nice. He played with her children and other children in the neighborhood. She saw him playing with his sister's grandchildren all the time. She was shocked when he was arrested. There were two sides to Ronald. One side enjoyed helping people. He recently joined the Lions Club before his arrest. He spent Sunday afternoons calling out bingo numbers to senior citizens. The membership director said that Ronald was well liked by everyone he'd met through the Lions Club. Then there was the deadly rapist serial killer. This just illustrates that you never know what a person is capable of. Ronald raped and murdered males for nine years before he was found out. Ultimately, Ronald Joseph Dominique pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in an attempt to avoid the death penalty. 
On September 23, 2008, he was sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences. The community which Ronald terrorized for nearly a decade could now rest assured that one of the Bayou's most prolific serial killers was placed behind bars and will never be free to hurt anyone again. The traumatized families of his victims finally got justice for their slain loved ones. May the victims rest in peace. All of this is alleged. Thanks for watching.